Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Pray that you're blessed through this session and that you connect with God's heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that you have purposes for us, that you're preparing us for those purposes, that you're teaching us, that you're training us, that you're leading us, that you're revealing your heart to us in, <clears throat> in so many ways. Help us to learn well. Help us to listen well. To be prepared for all that is in your heart. To be a good tool in your hand. To walk closely with you. To hear your voice. To respond to you. Teach us your ways. Make us grow. Make us mature. Make us blossom and flourish, Lord. Prune us where we need to be pruned. Lead us where we need to be led. Help us to have a heart that is always open to your direction and to your correction. That we might be all that you have in your heart. Amen. 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 Well, this week I want to talk about Psalm 90. I hope you've taken time to have a look through Psalm 90. It's not one of the easiest psalms. Some passages in scripture we look at and they're full of encouragement and full of good news. <clears throat> this is one that takes a bit of wrestling with, finding out how it applies to our lives, what it's really all about. And as I've said before, the context can help us to understand things in a different way. Well, this psalm is one of the ones that wasn't written by David. This was a psalm that was written by Moses. And better scholars than me um, have said that it was written towards the end of his life. Um, and the circumstances that this came out of will become more apparent as we go through. But I believe God has got good things for us in this, as we go through this psalm. So, verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 90, it says, Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. Whatever we're doing, that needs to be our starting position. That needs to be the foundation for everything else in our lives. That God began all things. He rules in all things from beginning to end. He is God. We see our circumstances very differently when we view them all through that lens that he is God and that he is good, that he planned before anything began and he is still outworking his plan. Whatever your circumstances are today, however bright or dark they are, knowing that God is in control and that he is working out his plan will help you to see everything differently, especially if you trust him and your heart is to walk with him and to obey him. If we don't have that trust, then when things are difficult, where is our hope? But he is our hope. He is our firm foundation. And he is always good. Verses 3 to 6, it says, You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. For you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They are like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. It's kind of a gloomy thing to say. It's, it's a bit like in Ecclesiastes where 
it's all, it's meaningless, it's meaningless, everything is meaningless. He's obviously not having a good day. He's in a dark place. And he's led Israel for a long time. And there's been such a lot of disobedience, so many frustrations. And I, I think he's kind of weary. He's weary with all of it. Now, if people that don't belong to God do wicked things, that's one thing. But when people that are called God's people, when people that God has revealed himself to in spectacular ways and brought such an amazing deliverance for them, when they have gone their own way, that's very different than people that don't know him. If God's enemies won't listen to him, it's one thing. But when his people won't listen to him, that's quite another thing. And that was the history. It was terrible. You know, if, if somebody that doesn't know me and, and doesn't care about me doesn't listen to me, that's one thing. But when people that really matter to me don't listen to me, that feels really different. Same with God. People that are meant to know him. People that he has been deeply involved with when they persist in going their own way. The grief and the anger for God is very different than people that have never known him. It's about the relationship. It's about the respect. It's about the listening. It's also about the consequences. The consequences of people that know God's heart not responding to it is very different than the consequences for people that don't know his heart. Very, very different. A very different matter. And Moses had been dealing with so much grumbling, so much complaining, a lot of rebellion. He'd had so much to contend with for so long. And the rebellion and He'd, the huge responsibility, he'd carried the weight of a nation for a long time. And I guess he'd got kind of weary of it. And sometimes we feel a little worn down. Many of the people had died before their time, really. God, you know, a whole generation that had rebelled against God, they died in the wilderness. That whole generation had to pass away. Many people had died before, their, before it was really appropriate. The only exceptions were Caleb and Joshua because they'd responded to God in a different way. But Moses had been caring for this nation and they'd had a lot of funerals for people that if they'd responded differently, it wouldn't have happened. What a job, what a, a path that they'd walked. God spoke to his people and he revealed his heart to them in so many ways. And he was so grieved, you, you know, if, if you think how we behave doesn't matter. If you read some of the passages in scripture, God is just crying out in just agony at how his people reacted and rejected him. We have the ability to grieve God deeply. How we are matters. You know, I don't like the idea of people that I don't know having wrong relationships. I th I, it's not good and my heart reacts to it. I don't like the idea of people that I don't know cheating and stealing and telling lies and but when it's people that I do know and their behavior affects me directly I feel very different same with God same with God God is a jealous God and people think that jealousy is wrong but it isn't envy is wrong covetousness is wrong wanting things that don't, that shouldn't belong to you. That's what covetousness is about. Thinking that 
you know, I should have Nico's car. He's got a good car and I should have that. He shouldn't have that. I, I deserve that. He doesn't deserve it. I deserve it. That's what covetousness is like. Or such a body's got a rich husband. I should have a rich husband. I deserve it. They don't deserve it. That's covetousness. But jealousy is when something should belong to you and it's being given to another. That is the jealousy that God feels when time that should be given to you by somebody that should be committed to you is given to somebody else, then it's right to feel jealous. When provision that should be given to you is given to somebody else, if Sam spent all our money on somebody else and left me without, then I would be right to feel angry and jealous because what should be mine is being given to somebody else. If attention that should be given to me is given to somebody else, then I'll feel jealous. And God was jealous. God was jealous because the love that rightly belonged to him, the obedience that rightly belonged to him was given to others. These people, you know, some people, they don't know how good God is. But the people of Israel, God had rescued them dramatically from Egypt. And they'd seen fantastic provision. They'd seen a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. Just constant manifestations of the presence of God. And yet they disobeyed him. And Moses was really weary really weary. If people, you know, like I say, if people don't know the goodness of God, don't respond to him, it's one thing. But they'd seen it. And so had Moses. Moses had seen God do incredible things. But Moses also made mistakes and made God angry. In Numbers chapter 20, Verses 6 to 12, God is speaking to Moses and he says, You and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock, livestock drank their fill. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am giving to them. So God spoke clearly to Moses and gave him instructions and he said, speak to the rock and I will cause water to gush out. But Moses got angry with the people. And he reacted wrongly and he hit the rock. And he also said, must we bring water rather than God and his provision is going to come through for you. It's, you know, he allowed his anger to turn into something nasty. And sometimes it's right to be angry. And there's a scripture somewhere, I don't know where it is, and it says, be angry and sin not. So sometimes it's right to be angry, but we need to guard our responses and we need to guard our heart because when we're angry, it can very easily lead us into hatred, bitterness, lots and lots of things, vengeance, um, oh, all kinds of things. 
um, bad language, um, violence, lots of things can come out of our anger if we don't deal with it rightly. And Moses was angry because the people were rebelling and he allowed it to come out in a disobedience to God. He started out by obeying God. He gathered the people like he was told. But then he allowed the anger to take over and he starts hitting the rock and saying things that were wrong. And then he carried on with wrong reactions. In Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 37 he said, The Lord was angry with me because of you. He said to me, Moses, not even you will enter the promised land. And rather than Moses respond and say, I'm really sorry, I let my anger get the bat better of me. I'm really sorry I reacted in a selfish and self-righteous way. And he's still being a bit self-righteous. Even you will not enter the promised land. He, he allowed it to carry on. A bit like in the garden when Adam and Eve, you know, he blamed her, she blamed the snake. And Moses is blaming the people rather than taking responsibility. He's blaming other people. And it just made matters worse and worse. Worse and worse. It says in Psalm 106, verses 32 and 33, and I'm going to read it from the, me the message. Talking ab and it's talking about the people of Israel, and it says... They angered God again at Meribah Springs. This time, Moses got mixed up in their evil. Because they defied God yet again, Moses exploded and lost his temper. So Moses saw how they were being, but he also allowed it to infect his heart and change his heart. Mostly, I think, we make mistakes, and if we're honest about it, God's position is that he's quick to forgive. He's quick to remove our sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sin. But the people of Israel, they persisted in rebellion, and God became angry. Moses blamed other people, and God became angry. Sometimes when we do wrong, the devil likes to make us feel that God is angry. But God is only angry if we don't allow him to bring his cleansing. He's only angry if we continue in our rebel rebellion. He's only angry if we don't confess, repent, take responsibility, allow him to forgive us, put it behind us and move on. He's so keen to forgive us that he sent his son to make a way. If you're feeling condemned, if you're feeling that God is angry with you, I, I don't believe he is unless you are deliberately going your own way. And if you are and you turn, he's so quick to forgive, so very quick to forgive. It says... In Psalm 30, verse 5, his anger is for a moment. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last throughout the night, but joy comes with the morning. God had spoken to Moses face to face. They'd had an incredible relationship. It says that in Exodus 33, verse 11, he'd had amazing encounters with God right from the burning bush. And he must have known how God had protected him as a baby. So many things as he was leading the people, um, all the plagues, God's protection over Israel, when the angel of death came and how God protected his own people when they got to the Red Sea and there was no way forward and God made a way miraculously and he'd miraculously provided for the people 
And yet in that incident where he struck the rock, instead of speaking to it, God said, you didn't trust me. You didn't trust me. After all that he'd walked through, he didn't trust. And when God spoke to him, he didn't repent. And it soured the relationship. And it didn't bring an opportunity for restoration because of how Moses responded. It says in Numbers chapter 27, verses 12 to 14, one day the Lord said to Moses, climb one of the mountains east of the river and look out over the land I have given the people of Israel. After you have seen it, you will die like your brother Aaron, for you both rebelled against my instructions in the wilderness of Zin. When the people of Israel rebelled, you failed to demonstrate my holiness to them at the waters. God wanted Moses to demonstrate his goodness, but instead he allowed his heart to be like the people and he rebelled as well. If you're going through frustration and difficulty, don't allow what's going on to have your heart. Don't allow your circumstances to corrupt your heart. And don't allow even your own sin. Don't allow anybody else's sin. But don't allow your own sin either to come between you and God. Bring it before him. And your difficulties, don't allow them to sour your relationship with God. Whatever you're having to walk through, even in the darkest time, don't let it cause you to feel that God doesn't love you and that he isn't good. Don't waste your difficulties. Whatever you're going through, allow it to bring about good things in your relationship with God. Don't waste that time. Don't waste your difficulties because God wants to bring good things out of even what you're having to walk through today. The next job for Moses, or the next job on the list, was to lead the people into the promised land. And God wants your difficulties to lead to promises. Sometimes the things that we walk through, the wilderness that those people walked through was because of their own disobedience, the ones that perished in the wilderness. But even their children that were destined to inhabit the land, they walked through a wilderness time. Some of the difficulties we face are our fault. Some of the difficulties we face are not our fault. But whatever we face, let's not miss out on the promises by a lack of obedience, by a lack of not learning through what we've been through, because God has fantastic promises. But Moses had come to a place where he wasn't the one to lead people into the promise because he'd stopped trusting. And if we stop trusting, we will not inherit the promises. Even when we don't understand what God is doing in our lives. We need to keep trusting so that he can keep leading, so that he can keep taking us forward. And God looked for somebody that would trust him and that would obey him. And Joshua was that man. Moses was no longer that man. Joshua was that man. Some people, when they do wrong, they say that their behavior is acceptable. And many times Israel did that. They said that wrong was right. They said that their behavior was fine. We can make excuses. We can blame other people. Or we can confess 
repent, be cleansed, and move on. That is what God wants. Don't rebel. These people hadn't made mistakes. They'd rebelled. Whether we've rebelled or whether we've made mistakes, we need to have short accounts with God and we need to move on. Because if we don't come into the grace, then there's the anger. God's heart, his default position is grace. His willingness, his heart is always forgiveness. But if we reject that, we make him angry. Sometimes the enemy does like to make us feel that he's angry, but he's so ready to forgive. And if we've asked him to forgive us, then he has forgiven us. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we've done that and the enemy is still accusing us, we need to tell him to shut up and to go away. It says in verses 10 to 12 of Psalm 90, 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80, but even the best years are filled with pain and trouble and soon they disappear and we fly away. He'd lost his hope. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. Man is depressed because he's lost his hope. His relationship is, is not what it was. His relationship is not an intimate relationship anymore. Moses used to speak to God face to face and he's lost that. It was tragic, really. But when we walk through periods where we're feeling low, where we're really struggling, we need to allow our troubles to bring us to the promised land. We need to keep walking with our eyes fixed on him. And if we are faithful, then we'll know his faithfulness. If we're not faithful, he will be still faithful, but we won't experience it. So even in the dark times, even in the difficult times, let's keep going until we get to the promised land because his anger is just for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. And if you're going through a really dark and difficult time, even if you don't understand it, God is doing something. He knows what he's doing. He knows the way. He has all the answers and he is good. So don't waste your struggles. Don't allow them to divert you. He is good and he is faithful. Don't waste your struggles. Allow them to teach you about the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Allow them to make you strong. Allow them to teach you about God's goodness. Allow them to teach you your areas of weakness where you need God to heal you, to restore you, to strengthen you. Allow them to teach you to listen to his voice and respond to his voice. Verses 13 to 17, it says, O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Let our children see your glory and may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. God's heart is to satisfy us 
with his unfailing love. And that can happen even in the tough times. And if we allow him, he will bring, but you know, it says, give us gladness in proportion. He wants to reward us for being faithful in the difficult times. He wants to give us blessing, which is greater than our struggles. He wants to give us blessing that is so amazing that it even spills out all over our children and the generations to come. If we choose to obey God, God promises to bless our children to a thousand generations. That's how extravagant his heart is. That's how good God is. He wants our children to see his glory. He wants us to see him move on our behalf. When Moses was born, there was a terrible infanticide. Pharaoh ordered that the baby boys be killed and Moses would, was hidden and he was rescued. When Jesus was born, again, all the baby boys were slaughtered. And in our times, again, many babies are being slaughtered even before they're born. And to me, that is part of the signs that God is wanting to do amazing things. And the enemy is doing all he can to prevent it. God is raising up an end time army. God is wanting us to be part of an amazing end time harvest. And the enemy is trying to wipe out much of that harvest before it even comes to birth. And it's a tragedy, such a tragedy. But part of our responsibility is that we are ready to be part of what God is doing, that we are dealing with our issues, that we are not being stopped by either saying that our issues are too small or that our issues don't matter or that our issues are too big. God is wanting us to be ready. I don't know about you, but God has been challenging me in many ways to be ready. He's been challenging me to learn again. I'm learning to speak Spanish. And I believe it's part of what God is doing in my life. And he's preparing me for something. And some of that I can see some of it is going to be part of our partnership with a church in Argentina. But there's a lot that I don't see. And God's been challenging me to learn again so that I can be a good tool in his hand. He's been challenging me to deal with my issues so I can be a good tool in his hand. I'm learning to play the guitar. You know, and so many times when I'm doing the lesson, I feel, what's the point? I'm not very good at this. What's the point? But God's challenging me to learn. And Eros is teaching me. And he's being a very good teacher. And But that voice comes again and again. What's the point? You're no good at this. But I've set myself to learning. I've set myself in many things to learn again. I've set myself to take good care of my health. Because I feel that I need to be in good health to respond to what God wants me to do. And I want to be a good tool in his hand. What is God challenging you to do? What is he challenging you to learn? What issues in your life is he challenging you to deal with? What is preventing you from being all that he wants you to be? We need to be well prepared. We need to be ready. We need to be equipped. We don't need to be hindered by sin or shame. We need to be equipped and ready. We need to learn. We need to be cleansed. We need to be fit and ready and active. What is God challenging you? Are you prepared to take the challenge? Are you prepared 
to deal with the stuff? Are you prepared to learn the lessons? Listen to those challenges. Be teachable. Listen when he's trying to correct you. Listen when the people that he's put into your life are saying things to you. If people say to you, you can do better. If people say to you, that's not good, you need to listen. If people say, there's a better way, you need to listen. If God is convicting you of things, don't be hopeless, don't be rebellious. Listen, respond to the challenge. Don't let God's anger or your anger be a stumbling block. Don't let other people's evil infect you and sidetrack you. Keep your eyes on the promise. Let your heart be prepared. Let your path, let your, it says about being, having a single eye. Um, I don't know where, but it's, it challenges us that our eye must be single. In other words, our focus is on one thing, not 10 things. And our eye must be on pleasing our Savior, our Lord, our God. What's your challenge? Take up the challenge. Take up the challenge. Have a soft heart. Have an open ear. Be a good tool in the hands of a good God. Don't be sidetracked. Don't be deaf when he speaks. Don't turn a deaf ear. Don't turn a hard heart, but respond. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Be lovely to see you in the cafe on Saturday. Be lovely to see you on Sunday morning. If you can come in person, it would be fantastic to see you. Be lovely to have you join us online. Weather permitting, we're going to have a sing in the garden again after the service. Be so good to have you with us. Be good if you could. Be good for you to join us again next Thursday. We also have a special this week. We're having a barbecue. After we've closed the cafe on Saturday, from four o'clock onwards, we're going to have a barbecue. It would be lovely if you could join us. Bring some meat with you. We'll cook it for you and we'll share it with you. Be lovely to have you join us at the barbecue. Be so good to see your faces. And in the open air, it's good to gather together. Please book. We'd love you to book because there is a maximum of 30 that can join us. So it'd be lovely to know if you can join us. God bless you. See you soon. Amen.